Hey folks, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant with you for the afternoon session. Have some great guests with me. We're going to get to that in just a couple of moments. We've been following the case out of Georgia, the Rosenbaum case, the foster child brutally murdered. I believe in that particular case. We're going to get to the details there. But before we do that, we have some breaking news out of Arizona. You may recall the case against Brittany Zamora, the sixth grade teacher who had been accused 15 counts of uh, inappropriate sexual contact with a 13 year old student, uh, including having a little uh, dalliance in the classroom while the other kids were watching a movie. She pled to many fewer counts, but today was sentenced and she could have been sentenced up to 30 years. So if you look at it that way, the 20 year sentence could be considered a bargain. Uh, the actual spread of, of uh, potential years w was really uh, up beyond 40 or 50 if she had not taken a plea. Remember, this was a plea deal. This was not a jury conviction followed by a, a judicial sentencing. This was a plea deal and the judge just had to kind of pick the numbers in the given range. So uh, now she will be taken to prison. 20 years is the sentence. We're still trying to figure out exactly what that might mean in real years in Arizona. Uh, maybe it's 10 before she's eligible for parole, maybe less. But that is the sentence. That is the conclusion of the Brittany Zamora case. Uh, again, pleading guilty to the charges that led to that sentence. With me to talk about these things, uh, I'm telling you, uh, Judge Ashley Wilcott, first of all, let me bring you in because uh, this is, uh, you know, I know you do juvenile cases and 13 is probably on the border between juvenile and new adolescent, new teenager. What are your thoughts on this case, this sentence? Listen, so yes, it's a big sentence. It's a steep sentence. 20 years is a lot of years. I think the frustration of public is going to be, hey, if she got 20 years for basically raping a preteen, I'm just going to say it the way I call it the way I see it, is why aren't those who are convicted of crimes that involve killing someone not sentenced to that many years sometimes? So I think the message is, listen, this is how we're going to treat these type of perpetrators and sexual offenders, which is good. I agree with it. But I also think that now we have to look at and other serious crimes also need to receive steep sentences. So, you know, we, we we've been inundated most recently with all of these uh, sexually based cases and defendants, and it's getting a little uh, you know, overwhelming sometimes. But this case, certainly she did not get what I would call a an Epsteinian treatment in this matter. Uh, you know, this may have swung the pendulum to the other end. Let me talk to, uh, hey, Judge, my favorite judge out of Dallas. Judge, let me ask you, I'm inundated with judges today. I, I, I've got to be on my, my best behavior. Oh, he's, he's going to join me in a minute? Okay, let me uh, stick with my other judge. Hey, Judge, let me ask you, when we look at this case, the Zamora case, and some of the outrageous conduct, why do you think she decided to plead in this case uh, when she clearly didn't get such a sweet deal? Right. I mean, it's not a sweet deal. I, you know, maybe she just didn't want to have the public humiliation of a trial. Maybe she finally somewhere found she did say she was sorry. She did say she wanted counseling. So she may have had some type of remorse that said, hey, I'm going to go ahead and enter a plea because I did do this. But some of the facts that are especially disturbing, and I think the reason for a 20 year sentence is, again, the age of the victim, 13. Again, she had somebody stand as lookout, not somebody, another student, by the way, stand as lookout so she could have sex with this 13 year old in a classroom. Those facts are particularly egregious. Yeah, you know, and if you listen to some of the details, yes, she had sex with the kid in the classroom while the others are watching a movie and she wanted to do it more often. Uh, and uh, the lookout that they employed in uh, the first case decided, you know, that maybe once is enough. I'm, I'm not going to get further involved in this. I mean, that that's outrageous conduct. Then when you listen to her and hopefully we'll have some of her comments uh, at the sentencing, we're working on getting that for you. Uh, you know, she sounds like a little kid herself, so I'm sure I'm no shrink, uh, but I'm sure there's some psychological issues here that make her very immature and, 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 and a predator in the weirdest way. Judge, what do you think? Oh, I completely agree with you. Predator is the best word to describe her. And keep in mind, I think every all the listeners know this, but need to be reminded that, hey, 20 years does not mean she's going to be in jail for 20 years. We all know that there can be all kinds of hearings and parole hearings and motions, and she may not actually serve the 20. The biggest, most important thing is, number one, punish and deter. But number two, this woman needs some serious help and treatment while she's in jail. And if we need to you know, kind of take something from this, we can all learn from as parents, the parents of John Doe, the 13-year-old kid, 
found texts on his phone because they had one of those apps on there that kind of triggers an alert if certain words come up. And they kept saying, baby, 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 baby. They pulled up these texts and boom, baby is the teacher. So, uh, you know, for those of us who, who are concerned about that, this kind of software is incredible. And that's what led to the confrontation when the teacher actually called the father and said, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, was that the best move, Judge? Yeah, 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 I don't know about that. Again, maybe she felt some kind of remorse, but congratulations to these parents for parenting and parenting effectively. I see a lot of cases where parents don't. Talk about a mama bear. She stepped right in as soon as she realized there was something amiss and the father did too. So kudos for them uh, catching this. You know, uh, as we go forward, you know, in this environment where everybody, it seems, has some sort of connection to sex trafficking, underage sex events. I mean, are we going to see the pendulum swinging closer to this, what I'll call the Zamora outcome? Certainly, hopefully, than we've seen in the Jeffrey Epstein outcome. I hope so. And then I think we have to ask the question, does the sex of the perpetrator have to do with the actual sentencing? So whether it's a female adult or a male adult, does that affect the sentencing, the outcome? Do some societies think, hey, or members of our society think boys will be boys and excuse men to some extent? All of these questions have to be asked. And I hope to see continuing stiff penalties because the only way to send the message, you're going to spend time in jail if you do these atrocious crimes to children. These are children, 13, 14, 15, still children. So I hope that we continue to see this pendulum swinging in this direction personally. Yeah, it is outrageous. And I think the Epstein version two is going to be quite the indicator as well as to how society and the law enforcement system is going to deal with this. Judge, stick around. We've got plenty to talk about today, and I appreciate you being here. We're going to go on to uh, uh, Nelson now. We, first of all, we, uh, we got to remember this Nelson case because it's, it's a doozy. You know, uh, it, it was with us for more than a, a couple of weeks. The penalty phase alone dragged on. Well, ultimately, he was sentenced, or at least a recommendation was given by the jury, and that recommendation was good old LWAP, life without parole. They struggled with this thing for 16 hours, did the jury, and uh, finally decided there was at least one person on the jury that said, I can't put this guy to death, so we're recommending life without the possibility of parole. Let's take a look at some of the later action in that case. So there you see the uh, the conclusion of the Scott Nelson verdict in the penalty phase. Remember, uh, this I was trying to get a hold of the verdict form because it was voluminous. I mean, there were subparts to subparts and then subparts to those. They got to double A, double B, double C, uh, and uh, it was it was kind of interesting to follow, but it didn't mean a lot without context. And then of course they finally got to the to the bottom line. So joining me uh, again from Dallas is uh, Judge Birmingham. Judge, uh, how are you, sir? Doing good. How are you? It's good. Good. To see you again. good. Uh, an another lovely day in Dallas, I assume. We're about 180 degrees out with 100% humidity. Yes. But it, oh, it, but 100%. I was going to say, but it's a dry heat. But no, it's not. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, Judge, you've uh, followed this Nelson case. I mean, dramatic in so many ways, from the guilt phase to the penalty phase to the ultimate reading of this verdict. Thoughts, and uh, you know, what did we learn from this guy, if nothing else? Well, it was, uh, I think his testimony was fascinating. Some of the quotes that he gave um, about how he just had these outbursts during the trial and the way that he outlined the way that he committed these crimes, uh, the senselessness of it. He had a motive to get off of probation, and so he picked a random stranger to do that that he thought was wealthy. I mean, uh, that it was a very particularly heinous crime. His best day was life without parole. And I, I would love to know, although I don't know, but I would love to know if it was one juror that held out for life or if it was uh, you know a group of jurors or exactly how that went down yeah as I recall when they were polling the jury afterwards they didn't ask who did who didn't vote they just asked every juror if at least one of them voted for life without parole so we really don't know those exact numbers uh, judge Ashley let me ask you uh, you know this, this judge had a, had a tough job I mean this was a crazy case he had a defendant with nobody controlling this guy he was doing what he wanted when he wanted he was going to get on the stand say what he needed to say and, and everybody, everybody else be damned he didn't care um, the judge did a good job I'm gonna ask for your opinion on that but also your thoughts on a defendant who says, I'm a homicidal maniac, yeah, I want the death penalty, and then he doesn't get that. Is this all just crazy genius? What is this? 
Well, yeah, I think that's what we have to keep in mind. Just because somebody says that's what they want doesn't mean that's what the jury's going to do and the decision they're going to make. I think this jury did an outstanding job, and the jury verdict form showed this, that they took the law into account. They took the aggravating circumstances proven by the prosecution, and then they weighed all the mitigating factors, which is what they're supposed to do to balance it out, to determine what sentence they recommend. They did a phenomenal job. The point is, defendant be damned. It doesn't matter if a defendant gets up there and says, I want the death penalty, I want to be killed. That's not the decision for the jury to base it on. It'll be very interesting, Judge Birmingham, to see how this guy survives in prison. We know that he had it rough with the whole federal system. Boo-hoo. It was part of what led to his heinous crime here against Jennifer Fulford. Uh, but now he's, uh, he's doing some state time. Uh, you know, contrast the two for me. Well, hey, neither, neither one is fun. Uh, neither one has uh, come and go privileges, you know. But we saw this defense before in the uh, Zacharias Musawi trial. Remember the 9-11 the bomber? And... Uh, he was, you know, give me the death penalty. That's kind of the same deal, and it worked for him, too. I've seen it used here in Texas, and it didn't work. So he'll be in federal prison, I mean, at state prison now for the rest of his life. Yeah, I covered that Musawi trial, and, and I recall that. And, you know, that was such a different animal, especially what was going on at, at, at that time, uh, that I don't know. I just don't know if this guy is, is that smart. I don't know if Nelson is so smart that he thought, hey, if I throw out give me the death penalty, they won't, and then I'll just be, uh, you know, living high times at, at state prison. I, I just don't get that impression, uh, but he's a nut, and, and I, he's a wild card, and I think that's part of the reason, uh, Judge Ashley, that the jury wrestled with this for 16 hours. Absolutely, because he is a nut. He is a wild card. I think, too, that, you know, it's hard to say the mitigating factors absolutely outweigh the aggravating factors. I think that they probably felt sympathetic to him for the fact that he had a messed up lie uh, childhood, but guess what? Lots of people have messed up childhoods, and it doesn't mean that they're going to kill someone. So I think they took their job very seriously, as they should have, and deliberated for a very long time to make certain they took everything into account, and I commend any jury for doing that. You know, I'll bet you Scott Nelson's biggest regret was as he was clanking his way out of the courtroom for the last time that that's it. Show's over, pal. No more stage time for you. So that is it for Scott Nelson. He is uh, heading to prison for the uh, life without the possibility of parole. We're going to take a break. My great guest going to hang around. We're going to talk about a number of cases, including the Rosenbaum case, which we're live in in Georgia. So stay right where you are. Coming back to the Law and Crime Network.